Okay, so we're now in MATLAB, and you'll notice a couple things. I've opened up and saved an Euler method underscore W2020, and you can see that we've got our slides that we just finished here on the right. And so we're going to kind of walk through this example in MATLAB and talk a little bit about how we can solve these ordinary differential equations. So I'm going to come in here, and I will just kind of do some commenting at the very beginning. So this is ME273, and this is initial value problem uh, examples that we're going to talk about in this file. And as you recall, I always like to clear my um, command window. So if I hover on that and hit F9, um, I clean my command window. And then I like to clear all, oops, if I can type it, and I like to close all my figures as well. All right, well, the first thing then that we need to kind of explore is this idea where we have okay the exact solution okay so we're going to spend some time really quickly and just kind of write up this exact solution because we know this is the answer this is the true value and we're going to spend some time figuring out how close euler this method right here can get to the exact solution down here so we're going to start off by having um, a t vector so i'm going to call it t exact okay and it's going to go from looks like a t initial so i'll go t initial um, up to t final, okay. And if you remember, this is the default. It sets it at uh, zero point, or rather one. And if I can set it at zero point zero zero one, it'll be pre-resolved, and I'll be able to have a pretty good t vector right there. Well, I've got my time, and now I need to have my y exact. And then I need to copy over this equation right here. So I'm going to have my y initial. Okay, that's at y0 time is equal, equal to 0 at y initial times the exponential of, well, minus t exact. Okay, so there's a couple things that are not defined here. First of all, t initial. Okay, well, t initial is defined down here. Okay, so I'm going to copy and paste this up here. t initial is equal to 0. And I've got y initial. <clears throat> Be careful with the capitalized letters. Okay case sensitive in MATLAB. This is going to be at 1. Okay, and then I've got t final. Okay, and that's going to be equal to 4. Okay, maybe it's easier if I kind of put this in a different order. I'll suppress it right there. All right, and then I've got t exact, which is defined by this row vector right here, and then I've got my y initial, which is right here, and then I want to go off and just plot it. So I'll do figure 1, and then I will do plot, and I want to go from t exact y exact and I will make this uh, a line and I'll make it uh, black and I will even make it um, have a thickness of 2 all right well I'll hit control s for save then I'll hit run and uh, over here I have a figure that pops up okay and sure enough there's a decaying exponential, which is the exact solution right here. It goes from time 0 to 4, and the y-axis is from 0 to 1, and so maybe I should add some time and make some labels. So I'm going to come in here and do x label is time, and y label is, well, just y. I'll hit run again. Oh, I misspelled label. I'm going to bring it over here, and I've got time versus y, and this is the exact solution. All right. Well, I've got the exact solution, and I want to see um, what I can do with this uh, ordinary differential equation method called Euler's method, so that once I have slope information, I can plug it into this equation and slowly build up my y vector, all of my <clears throat> approximated values of y, over all time. Okay, so I'm going to come over here, and I'll label this as my... Oops this method. Okay, we're going to spend some time just copying over this equation to kind of explore what it is. Well, I've got y uh, i plus 1 okay, equals y i okay, plus some sort of uh, function. I'm going to call my function fun for now, or function. And it's a function of t i and it's a function of y i. 
Okay, and all that's going to be multiplied by a little dt value right here. Okay, so this is Euler's method, and there's a bunch of things that I need to go off and kind of define. First of all, is that I don't even have a y vector right here, so I'm going to come up and set y equals to, well, what should it be? Well, I need to have a y value for every single one of my times. Okay, so before I do y, I'm going to define t. Okay, it's going to start from, well, t initial up here. Okay, it's going to go some sort of, well, dt, and then it's going to end up at a, well, t final right here. Okay, that's great, but now I don't have dt. So I'm going to come in here and I'll define dt, and it's going to be slightly larger, in fact, quite a bit larger than the little dt for the exact solution. Of course, I can change this, but I want to try to get by with as large a time um, segment as possible. So now that I've got dt, okay, this is the same time difference between two values of time. Okay, we talked about that as in a large delta t from beforehand. Okay, it goes over here. And then I'm going to make my t, so let's see if I can run this. So there's my dt, it's defined as 0.5. I'm going to come in here and define my time. So I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 different time values going from 0 to 4. Okay, And then y is going to be equivalent with the same length as t. So for every time I have one value of y. Okay, And I'm going to set it up to be all zeros. Okay, So I'm going to come down here and I'll do help zeros. So we can kind of learn like what this particular function does in MATLAB. Okay, and if I do zeros n, it's going to give me an n by n matrix of zeros. Okay, well, I don't want an n by n. I actually want a row vector, very similar to the line 20, the time. So I'm going to use this one right here. Okay, and m is the number of rows, and so if I want one row. Okay, and n is the number of columns. That's going to be the length, okay, of t. Okay, so if I run this line right here, hit F9. Whoops, I misspelled length. Hit F9. All right, now I've got a placeholder for all my different Ys. Okay, so let's talk about this then. Well, at the very beginning, okay, I've got Yi. Well, that, when I is equal to the first, or the first time, okay, when I is equal to 1, this is going to be the very first Y value. But the very first Y value is actually known. Because this is an initial value problem, I know what Y1, or the very first time, is going to be for Y1. So I need to come in here and set Y1 to be, well, y initial. That's known. In fact, I'm going to suppress these things as well. All right, so now, in this method right here, I know that if i is equal to 1, so if i is equal to 1 right here, this right here is going to be y1. That's known. Okay, there's this little function. Okay, we haven't talked about that yet. But it's going to be a function of two values. This t1, which is going to be known, that's t initial, and also y1 again dt is already defined up here at 0 0.5, and so what we can do is that we can run all this stuff on the right-hand side and get our next value of y. Once we have that, well, then we take this term, pop it into the next one, and so we have y at time 2 with the function at that time, dt, eventually we get it back to y3, and so on and so forth. But before we can do this, we need to go off and define this function. Okay, so I'm going to go off and I'm going to define a function. Okay, and if you forget how it looks, you can always go down into the command window and type in help function. And it'll give you some examples. Okay, it's going to tell you what it does. All right, as a new function. In this particular case, I'm just going to copy and paste this line right here. In fact, it's probably unnecessary to do so. Okay, and this function, the name is going to be found on the right hand side of the equal sign. I called it fun. We know that the order of the arguments and the parameters are important, so looking back at how I call it, okay, I have time first and then y second. So I'm going to have time first and then y second. Okay, And then what does it return? Well, it returns a slope. It returns, okay, this function returns a slope information, and that slope information is found in this equation right here, this ordinary differential equation minus y. Okay, So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to return slope information, okay, and that return value right there is going to be defined with minus y. Okay, so this whole function right here, I need to save it, so I'm going to go control S. It's going to go in here, and it's going to look for any value called fun. There's one called my fun, but there's none called fun, so this is going to work out as a function in MATLAB. I'll hit save. 
it's saved in the same folder. So that means when I run it right here, this is going to look up and replace this function, well, with, sure enough, this value right here of minus y. We're going to come back to talking about how we can convert it into an anonymous function a little bit later. All right. Well, this is, of course, just for one step, so I need to put this particular step inside a for loop. Okay. So if you recall the syntax for a for loop in MATLAB, and if you don't, okay, you can go help for. Okay, and take a look at its function, read up a little bit about it, and talk about its variable and its expression, so on and so forth. But effectively, we need an end statement right here. And we're going to iterate from i equals to the very first element in each one of these vectors, both t and y. And we're going to go to the end of the time vector right here. Okay. We can also go to the end of y if we want it as well. All right, and so what this for loop is going to do is replay and repeat this equation multiple times, okay, in fact, nine different times, and slowly build up the values of y. I haven't suppressed it. I don't have a semicolon right here. So we're going to see this y vector increase in size as we move through this for loop. All right, let's run and see if I've got an error-free uh, uh, piece of code. All right, well, it ran, okay, and I'm going to go back up to the top of the command window. Okay, so if you recall, we define what dt is, okay, and we also then do a function called dy dt, okay, that's found inside this function right here, okay, we can go into it, and that's why this line right here is not suppressed, so every single time, we're going to be outputting some sort of dy dt, or the slope, okay, from this equation over here. So now that that's kind of working out well, I'm going to actually suppress that one, I'll hit save again, and then we're going to come over here, and I'll rerun it. All right, so what you can see then is that dt is defined on line 19 right here. It's not suppressed. There's no semicolon at the end of that line. I'm going to leave it like that for now. And then you'll notice then that we define y1, okay, on line number 22, okay, that is suppressed, so we don't get to see it. But then uh, on this line right here, we define both, well, we've already had y1 defined, but we're going to define y2 for the very first time. Let me go back down through the loop, and we're going to define y3, and then y4, and y5, and so on and so forth. Okay. And so after the end of this particular for loop, okay, we're going to have a whole bunch of different y's defined, and this is going to become our profile or our solution, our approximate solution to that ordinary differential equation. All right. Well, once we have that data, then we can start to plot it. So I know that a figure one is already active, so I'm going to put hold on. That's going to add additional lines and elements to my, uh, to my figure. And then I'm going to plot two things, well, t versus y. Okay, but this time I'm going to make it a line with a circle and then make it red. All right, I'm going to hit run. Does the same sort of thing. Oh, vectors must be the same length. Let's go off and try to discover what's going on right here. Well, I know I can type in length t. Okay, that's 9. That was defined before. Then I can type in length of y. Oops, length of y. Okay, so that means the length of y is one longer, which is going to cause me to not have one point each uh, for each one of these two vectors, t and y. As a result, I need to go back and figure out, well, why is y one longer okay, than t? Well, it happens because in this for loop, I'm going through the length of y, and at the end of y, I do one more, and so I'm going to append dynamically one more element, in fact, this one right here, to the end of y. Okay, as a result, then, I want to stop one away from the end, the penultimate one. Okay, and then when I stop at that eighth element, I'm going to add one more element into that ninth element right there. All right, so now that I've done that, I'll hit run. Everything looks good right here, and then I'm going to pull my figure off from the other screen. Okay, and as a result, now I can see my first... Okay, uh, Euler's method implemented over uh, the actual exact value. To keep things track, to keep everything in track, I'm going to add a little legend up here. Okay, so let's come and add a legend. And the way legends work is that it's going to follow what you um, have as your labels. So the first one is going to be the exact solution. Okay, the second element is going to be my Euler's method. 
Okay, you'll notice then that if you have apostrophes inside a string, sometimes you can do double apostrophes and that'll put an apostrophe inside um, your uh, string literal. Okay, I'll close that up. I'll hit rerun again. And bringing it off. Again, here we have now our exact solution in a black line. Then we have our Euler's method inside, or rather uh, with red circles. And to maybe make it more obvious, I'm going to actually make uh, Euler's method be a little bit thicker. So I'm going to add line width and size 2. And I'm going to make, um, instead of circles, squares. So I'll help plot. Going back up. I want to make square, so I need to change those circles right here into a square. <clears throat> so this means I'm going to make a line, and I'm going to have squares that are red. All right, and so here's our exact solution. Here's our Euler's method, and let's talk about this for a little bit. Um, the first observation, okay, is that we are jumping 0.5 seconds in time for every single one of the points, okay? And we're also noticing that we're kind of always underestimating the value. The overall shape is pretty good, but we're not doing such a good job at matching the exact solution. Well, as we discussed before, we can maybe decrease the size of our time step, and so we're going to go off and we're going to change 0 0.5 into 0 0.25. I'll hit run. Figure's done. I bring it inside the window, and now we can see that, in fact, yes, if I halved the step size, I'm getting a lot closer to hitting the exact solution, but I had to do a lot more work. I'm going to keep on going now and change this value to 0 0.1. You'll notice in the command window that there's more values of y, more values of t, as expected, and as a result, I'm doing much better and getting closer and closer to the exact uh, solution. All right, well, let's go a little bit further. 0 0.01, we'll do it one more time. Takes a little bit more time. Here's my X and here's my Y. And now when I bring in the figure, we can see that it's really hard to even see that black line. If I zoom in on it, okay, I can see that sure enough, I'm doing a good job, but even at 0 0.01, I'm still underestimating the true value, okay, based upon my uh, Euler's method. Now, at this point, right, it might be nice to kind of indicate what size of dt is it. So I'm going to add something to my legend that's dynamically updating based upon what my dt is. And to do that, all you have to do is come in here and make your string a vector itself of two small little strings. So the first string is going to be this one right here. I'm going to put a little comma between those. And the second one is going to be converting a string, or rather a number, to a string. Okay, and that value or number that I want to convert to a string is dt. Okay, so I'm going to come in here and I'm going to hit run again. Okay, and now if you can see inside my legend, I've got a little string. It's called Euler's method, comma, dt equals 0 0.01. If I want to go back, let's make this a little bit better right here. I change my Euler's method to say 0 0.5 again, the original one. I hit run. I'm going to bring it inside here, and now we're back to Euler's method of dt equals 0 0.5. All right, so we kind of went through this process, but these over here are the writing code reminders in terms of what variables do you know at the start and how will they be initialized. Well, we talked about that initialization process of uh, t initial and y initial, and in particular, uh, initializing y1 with that y initial. Okay, what functions are required? Well, we have a function right here that is going to return the slope information from that ordinary differential equation. Okay, what variables do we want to know? What is the process? Well, we really are after y for all time. That's defined in our time vector. Okay, and so what loops do we need? Well, we need at least a for loop because we know the length of that time. And then what's done before and after? And then how will we use the output? Well, we're going to output it in the same sort of way and compare it from our uh, Euler's method to the exact solution up here. All right, well, let's take a look then at what I've got on the next couple of slides. And sure enough, it's the same stuff that we looked at. For example, down here in the bottom right, we can see that with dt equals 0 0.5, okay, we're doing an okay job, but we're still underestimating what's going on. We're trying to match the exact solution. When dt is equal to 0 0.25, we're doing a little bit better. For twice as much work, we reduce the error between those two signals. 
And then, of course, with the DT of 0.1, we're doing a really good job. Okay, so I'm going to take a moment and kind of expand this out here for a second and talk about uh, this next slide, talking about the uh, error analysis between those. Now, if you recall, because Euler's method, we were truncating the third and all the other terms in Taylor series expansion, we can expect that because of that truncation, we have an error per time step of on the order of delta t to the squared. Effectively, if I go up, let me scroll up here quick, uh, to Taylor series right here, this term right here, okay, is the um, second derivative times an uh, x value squared, okay, and if that x is replaced with a t, we're going to have a t squared, and so all the error is going to be found in all these terms, and since this is the biggest error, okay, on the Taylor series expansion, okay, we know then that the error per time step is going to be on the order of that delta t squared, but that's just one time step. As we move along and as we increase the size of y, or whatever our output variable is, okay, the error is going to accumulate so that on average the global error is on the order of delta t. Okay, a whole bunch of delta t squares is going to eventually add up to on the order of delta t. So how do we reduce that error? Well, we saw beforehand that when we reduce the time step, okay, we can of course decrease both of the error per time step and the global error. Okay? And in, it's interesting that with linear equations, as you'd expect with other things that we've done in the past, with other numerical methods, we can get perfect results if, in fact, that derivative information, that ODE, has a constant value as the return for this function. Okay, well, let's talk about this next example right here. Okay, so I'm going to shrink this back down. Okay, and we're going to spend some time now talking about this equation right here. Well, uh, it's probably time now to talk a little bit about these anonymous equations. Okay, anonymous equations, uh, if you recall from just a few slides up, okay, it was kind of introduced right here, where you can actually have an equation that represents a function right inside your main file if it's small enough. Okay, so if you take a look at this function right here, we can see that it's really only one line. Okay, so it takes a lot of time to like kind of set up this extra uh, file, take some time to kind of define all these things. It'd be nice if I can just kind of define, okay, my function right at the moment that I need it. So, when do I need it? Well, I need it, okay, at the very beginning, right here, okay? So I'm going to define my function called fun, okay, and it's going to be equal to this at sign right here, and t and y, all right, and minus y, is going to be the function definition, all right? And this function, then, is going to work in the same way as this one right here, all right? It's a small little function. I'm defining it right here, and with this symbol right here, I know the name of the function, just like in my folder right here, okay? And it's going to return anything to the right of this little at sign right here, which kind of indicates that, okay, it's going to be a function of both t and y. This one is interesting because it's only a function of y, but we're going to copy and paste this for the next function right here. I'm going to do control R to comment out that particular line. And then I'm going to go down here and take this equation right here because this is my new ordinary differential equation. And in particular, it's been isolated such that I have dy over dt equal this long uh, polynomial. All right, so let me just spend some time just type, typing this out. 2 times uh, t to the third plus 12 times t to the second minus 20 times t plus uh, 8.5. Oops, that should be a t. Let me just check it here. It looks like it's good. All right. Now, this equation, right, is good for my differential equation, but I also have the exact solution. So I need to come in here, and I need to copy this line, okay, suppress this one with a comment, okay, and I need to spend some time Okay, taking this equation and converting it over to this exact solution right here. Well, it's 0 0.5 to the fourth. Oops, got this mixed up. 0 0.5 times t to the fourth. 4 times t to the third. 10 times t to the second. 8.5 times t, and then plus, well, 1. The reason I know that this is 1 is because if I did the integration directly, okay, I would end up with this little plus c value, but the c value can be known because I know that initial point. 
So when t is all equal to 0, okay, up here, I know that the y initial is equal to 1, and therefore I know that this is going to be a plus 1. I could also do the same sort of thing if I do this, y initial. All right, the last thing that we need to do is that this t is not really defined above here. It's actually related to t exact. So I need to go off and change all these to t exact. All right, so I've got my new function right here. Okay, I've got my exact right here, and now I need to go off and compare it with the Euler's method. I'm going to keep it at 0 0.5. Alright, so I've got this common error because um, t exact is in fact a row vector. So I need to come through here and make sure that I do element by element the times uh, to the fourth, the times cubed, the times squared, and of course uh, so on and so forth. I'll hit run. Okay, and I'm going to bring my figure result out that's on off the screen. Okay, and we can see now that my other method is trying to track this shape of the exact solution, but using Euler's method, I'm going to now overestimate uh, what my, my true solution is going to be, and so this is quite a bit of error. Okay, I'm going to move this legend down to the bottom right corner, okay, and I do that by moving my legend, okay, default, by doing location, and calling it to south, which is the bottom, and then east, which is to the right. Make sure that spells location, not locatio. Alright, I'll hit run. The figure gets popped up. And now here's my figure right here. Okay, so I've been able to reuse all my Euler method stuff, and all I had to do was change that function, so now I can use this as a tool set to kind of explore other functions and other values of dt. So first of all, I'm going to change this to half as large, so 0 0.25. I hit run. I bring my function back in, and sure enough, it's a little bit closer. It might not look the same, be, look the same because I've changed my y-axis. So I'm going to come in here also and change my axis to go from 0 to 4 in terms of time and 0 to 8 okay, in terms of the y. Control S. Uh, I'll go back to 0.5 again just to rerun that. So 0 to 8 on the y, 0 to 4, okay, so here is it when uh, the dt value, delta t, is 0 0.5. Okay, now I'm going to change it back to 2.5. Right, we're doing a lot better. Of course, we have to have way more function calls, but we're getting closer. We're minimizing the error difference between Euler's method and the exact solution. 0.1. All right, so now there's going to be a Euler's method value at every point 0.1. We're doing a pretty good job here. And then how far do we have to go? Well, let's do it to 10 times more resolved, 0 0.1. There's going to be a lot of values of x, sorry, of y and of t. Okay, and sure enough, now we've got a whole bunch of squares over top of the exact solution. But there's still going to be, if we zoom in close enough, a little bit of error because we're overestimating uh, the value. All right, so back to the slides then. Uh, as expected, we've got copies of those. It looks like I kept my legend in the top right corner when I made these slides. Okay, so we've got Euler's method at dt of 0 0.5, Euler's method at 0 0.25, and then Euler's method at dt equals 0 0.1. All right, well, let's do another example. This one is kind of unique because now it's a function of both y and t. So when we come back up here and define our new function, okay, <clears throat> we're both we're going to be using both uh, t and y. Essentially, beforehand we could have got by with just a function of y and just a function of t, okay? Because this is a function of t, this is a function of y. But now we're going to be using two different variables inside our function. Well, let's define it here. It's minus ten times y minus t plus two. Close those two brackets and then plus one. Okay, we have a new y exact, so I'll come in here and just uh, comment out that line. Okay, this one right here is going to be minus exponential, minus 10 times t. 
plus t plus 2. All right, same sort of problem now. This t is not the same t. We need to copy over t exact for each one of those. Okay. And then we're going to use, well, this function right here is the same as replacing it with that equation right there for this. I'll go back to 0 0.5. Okay, and I'll hit run, and we'll see how things happen. All right, well, when I bring this uh, figure back into focus right here, we can see that, sure enough, we're kind of following the pattern, at least right here, but we're overestimating. Then we're trying to correct, and we underestimate right here, which means that, essentially, okay, we're trying okay, to match this line, okay, but it's rather difficult because of some, what we're going to find in the future slides called instability. Okay. Well, we know from previous slides that if we decrease dt, maybe we can do a little bit better. So let's go off and change that to, first of all, 0.25. Here's the result. Okay, It's doing a little bit better for the first little segment, but then it's still kind of oscillating and it's not hitting even anything close or remotely close to the exact solution. Well, let's keep on decreasing and see how close we can get if we subtract a 0 0.05 from that. All right, now we're reaching an interesting point where we're kind of following it, and the values of our y are going to be bounded in the sense that it's not expanding and the error isn't increasing, but we're still not doing a really good job of tracking the exact solution in any reasonable way. Let's keep on going down to 0 0.15. All right, finally, we're doing a pretty good job now. We have some error here at the very bottom, but as we go up to later spots, okay, the difference between the black line and the red line is getting very small. And in fact, since this is kind of like in the linear region, we know that we're going to have exact solutions at this part of the curve. However, down here, we're still not doing really well. So let's keep on decreasing our dt to 0 0.1. All right, so same sort of situation. We're doing really good right here at the linear part of this particular uh, exact solution, but we're still overestimating okay, the value right here during kind of this uh, transition period during the exponential or when the exponential part is kind of active. Well, let's keep on going down to 0 0.05. And finally, we're reaching a... Uh, uh, delta t value, okay, that's doing a pretty good job of getting close to the exact solution. All right, so we had to go much smaller in terms of dt's to get close than we did with the other ones because of kind of the nature of this particular ordinary differential equation. All right, so let's go back to these slides, just kind of finish this up. All right, so this was the example when dt was equal to 0 0.2. Okay, you'll notice then that it was starting to be um, oscillating back and forth, trying to follow it as best it could, but it was struggling to do so. When dt was equal to 0 0.15, um, it wasn't so good at the very beginning, then slowly got better and better as we entered into the linear part of that solution. And this last one right here then, 0 0.1, was pretty good. And then at 0 0.05, right, we did almost perfect. So let me just finish up a discussion with this part about talking about consistency, order, stability, and convergence. So you've seen then that the difference between the approximate and exact solutions goes to zero as that dt gets smaller and smaller. Okay. And it's ideal, of course, when dt is less than 1 because that local step is going to be on the order of delta t squared. And we want that to be, of course, as small as possible. But the global error, of course, is also going to decrease as delta t approaches 0. And that's also a good thing. Okay? And hopefully our ODE is stable if it produces a bounded solution okay, for a stable ODE. And, of course, the opposite is that it's going to be unstable if it produces an unbounded solution like we saw beforehand for, for a stable ODE. Okay. And then convergence then is very similar to these principles, but the numerical solution approaches the exact solution as delta t approaches zero. Okay, and we'd say that it's converged, all right, if also it's consistent and stable. So there's a possibility of converging these two, the exact solution and the approximate, if it is stable and if it's consistent. So in terms of other things about stability, we called the Euler method a, an explicit method. Okay, because the new value is only going to depend on the previous values, in the sense that everything on the right-hand side of that equal sign is going to be current, and everything on the left-hand side is going to be one step ahead of that. Implicit methods are actually dependent on the current value as well. 
kind of a weird thing to think about, but there's other implicit methods that we might explore a little bit later. So these explicit methods, like uh, the order method, are said to be conditionally stable if, of course, they reach certain criteria. And in this case, the criterion that they need to reach is the step size. It's got to be small enough. Right? The exact stability criterion on the, st on the time step size can be derived for certain model equations. So effectively, if you have some uh, knowledge about the ODE itself, you can kind of figure out how small your step size is, very similar to what we talked about when we were exploring the uh, differences between round-off error um, and truncation error, and the differences and sources of error for algorithms versus the numerical uh, limitations of computers. But in general, if you run into stability problems, you can always have kind of these two options. Uh, decrease the step size, it's always a nice place, but that can only bring you so so far along. Eventually, you might have to switch to another different method that has less uh, strict stability uh, conditions. So, kind of uh, some key sort of takeaways and summaries is that if the ODEs are explicit, um, they're going to require one derivative function evaluation per step. And of course, if they're consistent, okay, then we can expect then that locally, one step is going to be on the order of an error of delta t squared, and then if it's a, a, a global error, then we can expect that it's going to be on the order of delta t. And so the global error of the difference between the approximate solution and the exact solution is going to be uh, related to your delta t size.